Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming back to part three of Jeremiah chapter seven, a message to the temple patrons. We are going to pick up in verses 25 through 27, going over the rejection that God's prophets face. And we will also wrap up the rest of the chapter. The first point is that God sends all of his servants, the prophets, to his people. Go back to Amos 3 to get context for this. But let's jump to some other verses in the Book of Mormon in 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 4. For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Tzidkiyahu, king of Yehuda, my father, Lehi, having dwelt in Jerusalem in all his days, and in that same year there came many prophets, prophesying unto the people that they must repent or the great city of Jerusalem must be destroyed. So this is the perspective from Nephi or Nephi. Nephi tells us that there were many prophets telling them that they should repent or they were going to face destruction. They weren't going to just be cast out of Yerushalayim, but they were going to lose their entire land of inheritance. That map that we had seen before, extending from Egypt all the way to Syria that we understand now. Quite a large portion of that coastal land. So who are all these prophets? And who are the prophets that were being rejected? Let's look at Enos 1.22. And there were exceedingly many prophets among us, and the people were a stiff-necked people, hard to understand. So again, this is a different time period, but it's a pattern that repeats, and it's demonstrated in the Book of Mormon here. In the days of Enos, there are, again, many prophets. And the context is still the same. Stiff-necked people who claim to be religious, they claim to understand heavenly things, but they are hard of understanding. They receive judgment from God through these prophets and are told to repent. They don't like it. So the prophets, these many prophets that God sends are rejected. Let's look at Ether 11 verses 1 and 20. There came also in the days of Com many prophets and prophesied of the destruction of that great people, except they should repent and turn unto Yahuwah and forsake their murders and wickedness. And in the days of Coriantor, there also came many prophets and prophesied of great and marvelous things. This is the same repeating pattern. It's the same context. This is why and how God sends his prophets. And they cried repentance unto the people and except they should repent, the Lord Yahuwah would execute judgment against them to their utter destruction. Like I said, it's all the same. It is even the same result, even in these later times. So why should we expect anything different today? The prophets that are supposedly from God sent among us, are they preaching the same things to us to repent and turn from our idolatrous religion and to seek greater understanding in order to avoid God's judgment and destruction, to prolong the days in our land of inheritance. Are we even in the land of our inheritance? What is the land of inheritance for the Gentiles? This isn't necessarily a physical land. This is a spiritual land, a heavenly land, a kingdom that is not of this earth. Some sub points I want to mention in this context of God sending prophets, his servants, Has God continued to send prophets to his people since he sent his son? There are these documentations of many, many prophets coming. And you can see that there was nearly an unbroken chain, but it's not completely filled in and recorded in the Old Testament. It could have been continuous since Moshe, but since Jesus Christ, Yeshua was sent to earth. Has there been a continuous chain of prophets. And if not, then why? Have there not been religious groups that stray, that become idolatrous? I would dare say that the entire Christian movement has been dealing with this. The entire reason for Protestantism is because of this. And yeah, you could consider some of those movers and shakers within Protestantism to be somewhat of prophets, to cry repentance. However, they weren't pronouncing judgment and destruction necessarily, but we are seeing that again today. We are seeing God sending messengers 
to speak these warnings, to preach repentance. It's not necessarily to just this imposter country of Israel that we see today or to the unreligious people. We'll see messages come up in the book of Jeremiah here to those external people. But I'm talking about those who claim to be God's people, the spiritual Israel, not the imposter Israel or literal people. Some more questions here. Are the prophets from an unbroken line that we have today claiming descendancy all the way back to Joseph Smith? Are they serving the same purpose as in the context of Amos 3? And this could even extend beyond Mormonism. Go to Catholicism and their popes because they kind of serve a similar purpose. They claim this unbroken chain of authority since Peter or since Yeshua. Are they serving the same purpose in context of Amos 3, which is judgment and destruction? Are they continuous are continuous prophets a sign for us to feel at ease in religion or a sign of the need to repent and return to God for salvation? I'm kind of doing a preliminary fitting of these shoes onto us before we get to the final summary at the end. But really consider these things and share your thoughts in the comments. I love engagement. A second point here, Yirmi Yahu is warned that the church is going to ignore him as he speaks for God. God tells him that he's going to be rejected. So a question again, are our prophets today ignored or adored by the church? Remember, it is the church that is rejecting Yirmiyahu. It is the people who claim to be God's people that are rejecting the servants that God is sending to them. Not the other people, not the other religions, not the outsiders. So are the prophets in our religion ignored or adored? If they are adored, are they truly God's servants? Do they fit the mold? Do they match the pattern that we see in scripture or is something off? Do they not walk and talk like these prophets of old? Because to me, they don't seem very similar. They are not familiar. And we have been warned so many times of these prophets that don't fit the mold. They don't bear the same fruit. They don't match. And why is it so difficult for us to see that? That's the whole cunningness of the devil, to fill at ease to feel comfortable, to seek these smooth messages. I hope you've been following along. And if not, go back to previous chapters. Go back to the year of Isaiah and you will get a better understanding of how this is all creating a massive picture and great understanding of this plan that God has and everything that he has foretold. Let's keep pushing forward through this. Now into verses 28 through 30. We're almost done. But here we are going to look at the pollution of truth. Here it is mentioned that truth is cut off from the church's mouth for lack of obedience and repentance. Now that is quite a claim. Imagine that coming today, saying the church is not speaking truth. It is not obeying, not repenting. Joel chapter one, verse five, awake ye drunkards and weep. Connecting this with Isaiah 28, drunkards of Ephraim. And howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. I wanted to mention this verse because this is the only other place I could find where this idea of cutting off from the mouth appears. And it is connected with this imagery of new wine, with drinking and with these drunkards. This new wine also connects with Matthew 9, verse 17, because we've been talking about this supposed new covenant which is really not new it's just renewed it's restored it's the original and always has been the covenant as god has claimed not these supposed replacement outward ordinances and things like that but it says neither do men put new wine into old bottles these are the words of yeshua and why well it's else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish Our vessels are the bottles. This new wine is all of these promises that God has given. This baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, becoming these nations of priests and these holy people, these peculiar people, given life, 
all these things that cannot go into our old, sinful, fallen vessels. We need to be renewed and redeemed. Continuing, but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. We make ourselves new bottles. We deny ourselves of ungodliness. We repent. We give an offering of broken heart and contrite spirit. And God will preserve us. He renews us. He quickens us in body and spirit that he may fill us with his new wine, with his new covenant, with all of his blessings. So therefore, the new wine going back, being cut off from the church's mouth, the truth being cut off for lack of obedience and repentance. They did not make themselves or seek to make themselves new bottles. They did as the Pharisees. They cleaned themselves outwardly only, but not inwardly. They were not inwardly prepared for this new wine, this new covenant, this new spirit to be born again. It's repeating today. It is always persistent through the church since the days of Adam to the time now. The second point is extreme repentance is needed due to the church having been rejected. And I say extreme because we need to consider to what measure will we go to seek renewal, to deny ourselves of ungodliness? How far out of the way will we take ourselves to avoid those things that we know are keeping us from receiving God's blessings, from being renewed, from being born again, from being filled with this new wine and this spirit of God, to be immersed in the fire of heaven and the Holy Spirit, not just sprinkled, because I think all too many of us are just comfortable with this sprinkling. We don't go very far out of our way frequently to deny ourselves of the world, to deny ourselves of our own life, to lay down that life. And therefore we only receive sprinklings. And yes, those sprinklings are marvelous, but they are just a small portion. They are not the fullness. And we need to be reminded of that. And we need to seek greater experiences and greater connection, relationship, and involvement with God. The third point, members of the church have done evil and abominable works in the temple. Yes, in the temple, in God's house. The temple may be called by the Lord's name, whether today or in times past, but God clearly states it is a repeating pattern. He does not accept it. It is taken in vain and placed vainly upon these houses, these buildings, these works of men. So what might we ourselves be blinded to that is polluting our temples today? What are we missing? Going to the last section of verses here, 31 through 34. This is the valley of slaughter. God is renaming and pronouncing judgment here. So the first point is that worship is debased. It is called child sacrifice. We've read about these murderers and these adulterers, these perverters, these polluted priests and leaders of the church. God is calling this child sacrifice. They are hunting the souls of their children. They're spiritually murdering them. So I also want to mention as a point that the temple and the meeting houses or synagogues, whatever you want to call them, they are the high places of Tophet. So the, the temple and synagogues in Yerushalayim is what I'm saying. These are the high places of Tophet because Tophet was in the valley called Ben Hinnom or the son of Hinnom. And you can see on this map here, Yerushalayim or the temple mount is up on kind of on the right corner. You have Gethsemane and then you have Temple Mount. Those are all the general area of Yerushalayim. Now down on in the left corner, not all the way in the corner, but kind of closer to the middle, you have Mount Zion or Zion. That is overlooking this valley of Ben Hinnom or the son of Hinnom. So the, these places of Tophet in this valley are above, right? On Mount Zion or in Yerushalayim. This valley under the watch of Mount Sion is named as a burial place. Like I said, the name was changed. It's a burial place for the spiritually dead, those children who have been sacrificed, who have been spiritually murdered and hunted in the name of false gods, vainly in the name of the true God. This mention from Yirmiyahu possibly could have been a prompt for King Yoshiyahu to mark Tophet as unclean or defiled. And this comes from 2 Kings 23.10. 
It says, He, the king, defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, or the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. So again, that talk of child sacrifice. Could it have been literal? Possibly. I know there have been evidences found of actual child sacrifice, burnt bones of small humans, but I think more greatly are the spiritual aspects of this. Look at Isaiah 30, 33. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. Well, who are the wood? The members of the church, we've read. The breath of Yahuwah, and we've read about that. The breath and fire words of God burning this wood, like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. So this valley, it's changed. Here's another aspect of Google Earth here. You can see, kind of looking from a southwest perspective, looking to the northwest at the Temple Mount, at the Valley of the Son of Hinnom at the bottom, Mount Sion in the middle, and the city of Yerushalayim near the top. So I mentioned back in chapter one that church members are the flesh in this vision that Yirmiyahu had. The church members are boiled in this seething pot. And furthermore, they are eaten by beasts and birds in this valley. There's also this theme of a joyous wedding and hope to create an eternal family being shattered. There's no more hope for this eternal family. This is kind of a change, a nominal change of this valley to now being a spiritual change of this family. Looking into this idea of this eternal family, go to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. You get a better perspective if you go back or haven't already gone through those videos of the latter half of Isaiah, where this theme of this eternal family or this family of God is really expounded upon. But it says here, I will greatly rejoice in Yahuwah. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So Yermayahu mentioned the bridegroom and the bride, these voices, this gladness, this joy being taken away from Yerushalayim, from the church, from the people. Well, who is the bridegroom? Who is the bride? We've talked about these things a lot. And who are these adornments, these jewels, ornaments? Look at Isaiah 62, verse 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. The bridegroom is God. The bride is the church and all of the members. Marriage is not just between a man and woman. Marriage is between a man, woman, and child or children. That is the word of God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. And Yeshua said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Christ is identified as the bridegroom. Christ is God. We have multiple parables. If you go to Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 through 14, you have the parable of the wedding banquet. This idea of this wedding, this family, this bridegroom and a bride. There's also in Matthew 24, verses 1 through 10, the parable of the ten virgins going out to meet the bridegroom. It's a very common theme. We need to be familiar and understand these things in great context. Let's jump to Revelation chapter 18, verse 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in me. Right? This gladness, this voice of mirth, it's going away from Yerushalayim or from the church, from the holy city. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride directly paralleling the words of Yahuwah in the book of Jeremiah. They shall be heard no more at all in thee. So it carries over from ancient times to latter times. Now, Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife, the lamb is the bridegroom. His wife hath made herself ready. 
I talked about our portion. What is the church's portion? What are the members' portion of the covenant? We need to prepare ourselves. It's not like there is no work for us to do. Repentance is readying ourselves. And yes, we need God's help. We cannot do it alone, but we must be doing something. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. This is expanding our vision of what this marriage is. Now, Doctrine and Covenants 58, 11. After that cometh the day of my power, then shall the poor, the lame, and the blind, and the deaf come in unto the marriage of the Lamb and partake of the supper of the Lord, prepared for the great day to come. So this marriage is also a supper. It is a feast. It is a consumption of flesh and drink. It is a completion of this covenant. Let's finally wrap it up and put the shoes on once again in our frequent practice to apply and liken these words to ourselves for our spiritual profit and learning. So consider Yirmiyahu's calling to these temple patrons here. Put yourself in the shoes of Yirmiyahu first. So imagine that God is telling you to go stand at the temple gate and you are going to tell all the people coming to worship that they need to completely change their ways, that their religion is corrupt. And you tell them that they trust in lies and they worship false gods going to a polluted temple that is ruled by thieves. How are they going to respond to you? How are you going to feel when God tells you to do this? I mean, this is just crazy to think about, to put yourself in this young man's shoes. And you are told that history will repeat itself as the church will be destroyed after the people are sufficiently warned by you and others, by all these servants, the prophets. And then you're told that the haughty members hold up their church as the eternal bride of Christ. And you are to tell them this and that they focus on building up their church. They build her up in pride rather than helping the needy people. You are to tell them that obedience is more important than temple work and that God didn't command it. As I said before, it seems like gaslighting when you don't understand, when you don't see the bigger picture. And you know, because God has told you that they are going to reject you and other true prophets and haven't listened to God's voice because of their evil heart and their evil works done in the temple. Now, who are you to judge them? God is judging them, perhaps through you. Are you comfortable? Are you going to be courageous speaking these words? Have you sufficiently denied yourself of ungodliness and lived the doctrine of Christ and received God's promises in order to go forth and speak these words in boldness, without hypocrisy? That's a challenging thing, right? Now, to fit this on very tightly, imagine with this change of the valley name, the Great Salt Lake will be known furthermore as the Great Brimstone Lake. They are going to miss out on the wedding feast, the feast of Christ, the feast of his bride, the church. The church isn't going to be his bride, but he's going to have a new bride, a different bride, an unfamiliar, an unknown bride. And his children are not the children that think they are the children. Put those shoes on you, and you have to go forth and do this. Now, flip the perspective and put yourself in the shoes of the temple patrons. This young man comes to you, and these other prophets come to you telling you all these things, telling you all the issues with your religion, and that you need to repent. Are you going to scoff at them? Are you going to ignore them? Are you going to adore them? Are you going to receive the truth with gladness? Are you going to be stirred to anger? Are you going to lash out at these prophets and call them false prophets? Are you going to twist good and call it evil? And are you going to twist your evil and call it good and justify yourself in iniquity? Are you going to claim innocence just as the people of old? Are you going to repeat history and be on the wrong side of prophecy? That is a dangerous place to be. 
you need to consider every perspective. It is truthfully marvelous how much you can profit and how much you can learn of the kingdom of heaven by doing this exercise and really putting yourself in the dark and in the light and measuring yourself up to the kingdom of heaven and seeking the spirit, seeking personal revelation. Develop your broken heart and contrite spirit. Put off the things that you have been told and given through tradition that are just outward, that are never going to amount to true salvation and only pretended false promises of eternal life. I have experienced these for myself. I have gone through this. I continue to go through this. I'm hoping that I can walk with you through this because this is how we can minister to each other. We can help each other. We can walk each other home and walk with Christ. Thank you so much for going on this journey with me. And I pray that you may all have the spirit that God may change you and may open your eyes to these things and open your ears, open your heart. So until next time, I'll see you in chapter eight. We are going to talk about more of this eternal family and this contrast with the earthly family, with the evil family. So stay tuned. Until next time, may God bless you all.